This is my Lexus LX470, which is basically just an upgraded Toyota Land Cruiser 100 series. And you can see I've got a rooftop tent installed on this thing. And when I first got the truck, it came with this stock roof rack. And that tent was um, everything that this roof rack could handle. So here's the sticker on the roof rack. It says maximum load 150 pounds. And that happens to be exactly how much the tent weighs. So what was the problem with the stock roof rack? Primarily, it's the crossbars here. And these are a lot wider in that direction than that direction. And they have a nice profile to them. It's an airplane wing, basically. So nice and aerodynamic. Not going to whistle as you're going down the road. But uh, they did flex quite a bit. However, the major flex came from these uh, feet here, which are made out of plastic. I have no idea why they thought they could get away with plastic. In the subsequent years, like 2006, this is a 2001, 2006 uh, had a metal uh, foot, with metal feet for all, the, all four corners. Uh, so this is just where a lot of the flex came from uh, because this front to back bar here uh, is plenty sturdy. This is, this is quite stalwart. So. Uh, not really a problem there. So this is the Achilles heel of the stock roof rack, but these crossbars weren't helping anything. Uh, and at any rate, I needed to redesign that roof rack, and that's what you're seeing here. So I 3D printed these feet, and we've got some aluminum bar stock for the crossbars, and I just generally lightened things up, and I was able to lower the tent a little bit. So stay tuned, and I'll show you how I did it. This is what the truck looked like when it first got to Portland here. And uh, you can see I had these green guy lines installed and those were just to keep the, the tent from bouncing uh, up and down as I rolled down the freeway. But most importantly, take a look there on the left. You see that gap where the, uh, the cover uh, is coming off the foot for the, uh, for the roof rack? That's not good. Here's some more evidence of those feet being under too much stress. You see the mismatch in the uh, in the gap there between the uh, the front to back rail and the cover on this side for the foot. And finally, this is what was causing those gaps. This the thing was bouncing constantly as, as I was driving down the road uh, back from California. This constant flexing was for sure going to fatigue the rack until it broke. So the rack had to go, and the first step in that process was to get the rooftop tent down off the roof. I've backed the, uh, the truck here into the driveway where the wheels are kind of the lowest spot. And also I've got the, uh, you know, the adjustable height control. I've got that dropped as low as it will go. So I should be able to slide uh, the tent backwards uh, onto some 2 by 4s So let me just get that unbolted and then we'll proceed. Okay, so we've got the, uh, the hardware removed. Here's our 2 by 4 slides. We're just going to slide the tent right down off the back there. Uh, are you going to help me out, buddy? Are you going to help me slide the tent down? Yeah. Okay, let's do this. Well, apparently this is only 150 pounds, so no wonder it didn't break the roof rack. Uh, the guys at the shop told me it was 220, but that's a lot lighter than I thought. Another small problem that the truck has is the hood won't stay open by itself. So I've got the stick wedged in there to keep it uh, up and I need to replace the gas struts here with the new gas struts. We'll just pop this part off right here and then that part down here. I think it should just uh, click into place. Yep. Super easy. Love these things. The hood is staying up and it shuts nicely. What are you doing, kiddo? I'm fixing the truck. You're fixing the truck? I'm using it to bang. You're using it to bang? Yes. Yeah, good good truck fixing. Thanks, kiddo. I'm using wrench. Oh, now you're going to use the wrench. Wait a minute. Down there. You want to fix down there some more? Well, let's show the people this part right here, which is made out of plastic. And that's really surprising. Is that surprising? Yeah, because it's supposed to be made out of aluminum, huh? But because it's plastic, that's why we only have 155 or 150 pound capacity on this roof rack, which isn't very much, huh? Okay, so we are removing the roof rack here and we've got three of the corners taken off and the two bolts here, I got this one taken off and of course the very last bolt is stuck and it is thoroughly stuck. So I have this 
T30, which is the largest one in the in the set here, and it's it's too small. So I need like a T32, maybe a T31, and I should be able to get that off. But uh, you can see I've been trying lots of things. I tried jamming in a an SAE sized wrench into the hole, and I tried banging on it to loosen it up, and nothing's nothing's breaking that loose. So. I just have to go buy that correct wrench. So frustrating to have to make a run to the store for something so silly. Yeah, so here I am at the auto parts store and they don't have the right uh, bit either. Apparently it's a T32 and they only have T45. I'm gonna have to get creative. Okay, put your glasses on, buddy. So keep your safety gear on. Do this part again? I don't think I need to. I think I'm gonna be able to get that open now. Hey, you have my glasses, please. So we're all done working. We don't need to, we don't need safety glasses anymore. Yeah. High five. Boom. Okay, let's lift this off. <sighs> have you ever seen the rain coming down on a sunny day? All right. Tuesday morning. About 8 a.m. This is gonna get dropped off at Mako here. So they're gonna sand through the uh, the clear coat to the base coat. They're gonna put a new paste coat layer down and then a new clear coat layer down. And I have the option to feather in the fenders so that the new paint matches the old paint because, um, well, there's gonna be fading on this paint here. So if I just get new paint to there, there'll be a color difference. But I don't think I care that much. Here's the estimate from Mako. So that would be feathering in the fenders so that the paint matches color. So that's $63 a piece, so we're talking 125 bucks uh, just to color match that. Yep, there it is, Mako. There's the truck. End of the day, two days later, and it's done. Looks gorgeous. No more, uh, no more leprosy on my truck. So I am, I'm pretty happy, you guys. I went to Metal Supermarkets and got these two lengths of aluminum pipe. One is longer than the other one. The longer one goes in the front, and these should do nicely. So this is the original, um, you know, foot for the for the the rack that came on the on the truck here, and you can see this geometry, and then there's this rubber pad which has some changing geometry to it, some like um, curvature to it. So I wanted to model those two things into a single part. Uh, just to you know, make things easier for myself. And so that's what this is. You can see the uh, the mounting feet uh, there look very similar to what we find on this part right there. And yeah, using this part, bolting it on, I was able to find the misalignments and the fitment problems with between the roof and the part. And so then I made these two parts because it turns out that the front part and the back part here uh, have different geometries. So uh, this one says F or rear. This one says R for rear. And so this one uh, had problems. There was gaps between the, uh, when I installed it here, there was gaps between the, um, the part and the roof. So uh, I was able to adjust those. And so these parts here now have a lovely fit uh, between the roof and the part. You can see it, no gaps whatsoever there or there. And the same is true of that part up there at the front. So what I need to do now is uh, pull that part from right there and install it on this side. It'll it'll fit close enough. You can see it's fully snugged into the pocket there, but if we go to this side, to the actual part that we want to see, um, I'm, uh, I'm off by an eighth of an inch on my calculations there. So four feet, uh, that's an, exactly a 48 inch uh, piece of aluminum. So gonna have to adjust that, that's the first thing. But uh, the good news is if I lift this up out of the uh, thing and just put it across the tops here, um, we see no daylight underneath that so that um, that angle is perfect on this side uh, which means that I'll just mirror image this part here and it'll be uh, it'll be perfect on both sides so uh, the 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 next problem to solve is how we clamp the bar to the roof and this is the drawing of uh, my solution to that problem so uh, the highlighted portion here is the 3D printed geometry uh, that's going to be made out of, I think, uh, carbon fiber impregnated PETG for the final print. Um, and that's gonna be functioning in nothing but uh, compression. Um, what we can see up the top here is a is a steel bar, and I happen to have some stock uh, that I can grind and drill to that shape. Um, doesn't everybody have a random bin of metal 
chunks of metal. Uh, you know, I've just been collecting them over the years for projects such as this. So these two bolts here are M8 by 1.25 millimeter thread pitch, which threads right into the hole there on the roof uh, where the roof rack is supposed to go. And those are 90 millimeters long. And those actually are a bit of a problem because I went down to my local hardware store here in the United States and they wanted $2 and like 65 cents a piece for these bolts. And I need eight of them. So uh, yeah, that was going to be real expensive. But here at McMaster Car, we can see that they're much more reasonably priced, 10 of them uh, for like 10 bucks. And then at my local bolt and supply store, they actually sold me eight of them at basically a dollar a piece. So that's that's what I've done. So I now have all the bolts that I need. So I just need to grind these uh, metal tabs to, um, to shape and drill the holes, and then also cut the slots in the aluminum bar, as well as print up the test geometry out of um, PLA, just to make sure everything fits. Every combination square that I've ever seen comes with uh, one of these scribes. Sometimes you have to unthread them. Um, so I'm using this sharp point here to mark the metal, to basically scratch the metal. And I made this 3D printed geometry here for the sole purpose of marking these slots, getting them precisely located. And then on this side, I've also marked across the top here uh, just to, to see where I have to cut to the end there. So same, same story down here, except that I flushed this side up. And this tool is from my bike mechanics uh, you know, toolkit, and this flange at the bottom here clamps into the bench vise. Then the bar gets clamped into this hole right there using the, uh, the, the lever at the top there. And then right here on the side is a gap between these two pieces of metal, and that's the guide for the hacksaw blade. So this makes for perfectly straight um, cuts that are precisely located uh, on bar stock. It's a great little tool. Let's get to work uh, making these uh, crossbars. It's extremely unsafe. See, if I get this caught, like down wedged between the wood and the blade here, it's likely to break the blade into many pieces. And this is spinning at like 14,000 RPMs. So these are gonna be projectiles, like bullets, chunks of this blade flying off this thing. So I stand over to the side as I'm grinding on this extremely unsafe and stupid jig. So you should not make something like this. It's, uh, it's a death trap. Okay, so you can see the uh, the scribe marks there around the uh, around the hole, and you can see that I've drilled out two holes at the top and the bottom. Then I used this uh, coping saw, jeweler's saw, uh, to sort of cut in between the holes. And now I'm just using this needle file here to file it down to the final shape, which is slow going. Is it working? Yes, it's working just fine. So I'm gonna do some slight modifications to this surface right here, but all of the sort of cradling hardware or mounting surfaces as well as the, uh, the surfaces that, that uh, engage with the roof, uh, those are all working quite well. Uh, so basically, finalized geometry. There you go, that's how you do it off. Yeah, go back and forth. Pull hard, pull from the far end. Pull from up here. Yeah, that's how you do it. Good job, keep it up. So what I've got here as the final solution is the uh, the geometry that's been slightly modified. So the front edge and the back edge are flat. So it's just kind of this pyramid shape. And underneath the the, the surfaces, which we're gonna be bearing onto the, the roof, not onto the, there's a sort of a bolt structure underneath there. It's kind of sturdy. So that's the primary bearing surface. But this secondary bearing surface, I didn't wanna be damaging the roof. So I printed up these, um, TPU flat pads so that they are sort of like squishable and so they'll be uh, better for bearing onto the roof here So yeah, that works really well. I've actually put all of my weight on that stood on it I've yanked on it as hard as I can uh, You know, it's not it's not going anywhere uh, So times four of those it will be more than adequate to handle the 150 pounds of the rooftop tent as we're driving down the road now what I need to do is come up with a nice uh, You know cover that's good-looking to cover up all the hardware here now is a good time to talk about the uh, the strength of the uh, the pyramidal shaped plastic parts. So we can see here in my slicing software uh, just what these things look like uh, as they're being printed. Uh, you can see there's four 
outer uh, walls, and then there's almost a fifth wall uh, because of the way that the the grid um, infill uh, works uh, in here in Simplify 3D, my slicer software. And yeah, this is going to be uh, plenty strong. Um, you know, it's just sort of a random guess here, but I suspect that these uh, these parts would hold about a thousand pounds uh, before crushing. Um, so, you know, I could I could hold a lot of weight on that roof rack up there uh, as far as ultimate strength goes. Now, and f as far as fatigue goes, there's no movement in the, in the roof rack. So we're not going to have any fatigue problems either. And then in tension, which is the big problem with 3D printed parts for strength, the uh, the layer lines tend to tend to separate. So there's no tension uh, forces going through this part. Uh, those go through the bolts and through the steel hardware. So this is incredibly strong, much, much stronger than the stock solution. These covers look pretty good, um, but this first iteration is kind of flimsy. Uh, you can see it just sort of flexes a lot. Um, plus, I had uh, problems printing it. See, so it was just too thin and it just sort of flexed as the print has was, was moving about on it. And we've got uh, some some mistakes happening there too. So I have to redesign this thing for printability and to be less flimsy. We're in the final stretch here with the, the printing of this cover. And then down here, we've got the, uh, the blocks. These are the pads that the tent will sit on on top of the, uh, the crossbars there. Hi. Hi. Okay, we're gonna put this cover on over the, uh, Dad, over the hardware. Dad, I need to hold me. Okay, I'm gonna hold your pants so that you can't fall off. Okay, I got your pants here. You can't fall off the roof. Hit it hard. Like this? Yeah, like that. There you go. It's on. Good job, kiddo. High five. So the final step in this installation is to attach the tent itself to the crossbars of the roof rack. And to that end, there's this C channel where these uh, plates slide up inside of it. It's not the easiest thing to get done. But there we go, I've just slid that in there. And what you end up with is an assembly that looks like this. Um, so you can see that the carriage bolts go through the top plate into the bottom plate. But the problem is this bottom plate here uh, is flat and the nuts stick below the plate even. So this creates a whole lot of, um, well, hardware and stuff that protrudes lower than that bar. And we can see how close that bar is to the roof. So if there's any flex at all, uh, we're gonna get damage to the roof of the car. So that won't work. So I've taken um, one of those plates and I've bent it into a U-shape like so, and you can see that it would it would get the job done. But it's uh, it's not ideal, and there's a bigger problem than that. And that's the fact that it took a lot of force uh, to bend this. I was hitting on it with my sledgehammer and my poor little $15 vise here. You can see that I've sort of rounded the edge over on the vise jaws and I broke off the bottom clamp portion of the vise. Thankfully, there's still uh, these screw mounts, so the vise isn't completely useless now. But yeah, uh, that was just making this first one. So I don't have it in me to make three more. I would have to go buy a new bench vise or something like that, which I certainly need to do at some point, but uh, I'm not trying to upgrade my shop at the moment. Uh, that comes later. So instead, I've got this, um, what was this, a kick for a door. Like way back in like 2003, uh, when I was installing windows and doors as a professional finished carpenter, uh, I, I just had this extra you know piece that I've kept in my random bin of metal parts uh, for all this time. And so I've cut these strips out of this uh, stainless steel here, which is decently thick stainless steel, and I'm bending them into shapes that look like this so that I can mount the tent to the roof rack. And this is what those parts look like when they're done. By the way, in order to cut the, uh, the stock, uh, you know, the, the pieces out of the stock material, I used a combination of this little rotary cutoff wheel here in my Dremel tool uh, in combination with this um, metal shears. Now, these are not nearly uh, powerful enough to cut through this stock by themselves. So basically I scored a line and then the metal was more thin and then I could use the, uh, the cutters here. Once I'd done that, I could just drill the holes and bend them to shape. And the job is done. So just to recap here, starting from the right, we've got the, um, the, the cover that covers the, um, you know, the hardware, the mounting hardware. And that is load bearing here at the top. 
Uh, so this part of the shell of the tent sits on that. This portion of the frame sits in this little cradle here, so it's really close to the um, to the mounting hardware. So that could hold, you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of pounds uh, because it's such a short distance. It's not cantilevered off out there. So I think most of the weight is being supported right here uh, on all four corners. But then we go to the middle, and this is where the tie down uh, is occurring, and the tie down also is a uh, is a load bearing pad. And then here we have the overload pads, so if, if like five people are sitting in the rooftop tent or something and this bar bends, then the, uh, the rubber here will touch the roof and it won't, we won't get metal on paint there, so we shouldn't scratch it. And then, of course, we just duplicate that on the other side and then uh, up there at the front as well. And there she is, fully installed and ready to go down the road. It looks kind of like a luggage carrier, that's what everybody thinks it is. But, uh, nope, it's a tent. So the joy of living with a two-year-old is that things go missing. I had to replace the metal buckle, that nice metal buckle, with this plastic one because uh, the metal one got put somewhere by the kiddo. Um, so the next problem to solve is the airflow coming up off the windshield is likely to blow water straight up under the, uh, the lip here. And the tent underneath is waterproof, that's true, but uh, you know, mold can still grow on the outside of it and all that. So I really don't want to have any water uh, being blasted up into the tent uh, as I'm driving down the road. Are you done, Dax? Can I use those? Can I use those now? Those go to the tent. I need those. No, no, I need to play with them a little bit. But I need to, I need to get the tent up. I need to install the tent, buddy. Come on, come on. Can I? No! Please? Please, come on, let me hit, let me put the tent up. <laughs> That's what the tent looks like uh, when it's fully deployed. It's pretty awesome. Uh, but I do want to be able to uh, sort of get it as watertight as I can get it when it's enclosed, when it's fully, you know, clamshelled up. And the reason for that is that I don't want to take it off the truck very often. Uh, this is my daily driver, and I don't want mold to be growing on the outside of the tent. Like I said, this is, uh, this is waterproof fabric, but that doesn't stop mold from growing on the surface of it. So, yeah. Anyway, tune in next time when we get to that little bit of, of uh, shenanigans. And in the meantime, uh, I think I'm going to take my family camping in this in the near future. So, thanks for watching. Tune in next time. See you then.